Hi, I'm Ken Howard, and welcome to the Gay Therapy LA podcast. Today, I'd like to talk with you about gay men coping with single life, tips and tricks. So, at the time of this recording, which is in May 2020, we're in the midst of the global COVID-19 coronavirus crisis and in that lockdown quarantine condition all over the world. But I am continuing to provide both therapy and coaching services to my clients who live locally to the, the greater Los Angeles, West Hollywood area in California, as well as across the United States and even around the world. And I've noticed a striking pattern emerging over the course of the past couple of months. Guys who are single, wherever they are, are having a harder time coping than those who are partnered or married. And isn't that just the thing with life in general? There's a saying, company doubles our joys and divides our sorrows. And various research has shown that people who are partnered or married, gay or straight, I think, have overall longer life expectancies and health histories. So when a regular fan of the podcast from San Diego, and you know who you are, Mr. R., uh, sent me a note asking me to address tips on many aspects of life for single gay men, I wanted to respond. So here are some tips for these 12 areas of life based on how I've seen my single clients over the many years, 28 years, of doing therapy and coaching for gay men and seeing how these guys thrive. And even from my own experience as a longtime single adult gay male for almost 20 years in Los Angeles before I was partnered and married to my husband now. So, number one, creating a home. I think the very inspiring New Age author and speaker, Louise L. Hay, used to talk about how our home is a reflection of us. Having decorative objects that surround us remind us of happy times, like a vacation souvenir or a family heirloom, or maybe something that we've kept, that we've grown up with. And these can be a continuous visual mood boost when we're surrounded by them where we live. And Louise Hay recommended um, trying to find spaces that gave lots of natural light to live in. And choices in decor, what we can afford anyway, help express externally who we are and our likes and dislikes internally, you know, even politically. Like in my home, I have this quirk where I don't display any heterosexual images except for photos of family members as a protest against widespread heterosexism in our society. In our home, we have only neutral or gay affirmative dyadic images. For gay men making their house have a sense of home, there's an, another uh, blog article that I wrote years ago about gay men making your house a home. Because we don't want to make it about stuff, but at the same time, what we're surrounded by as our home is our sanctuary can have a really strong impact on our quality of life. That's why if we live in a place that's unsightly or unsafe, we really want to work hard to move because um, it can have a negative effect as well. But a, a positive effect, a positive atmosphere, as Louise Hay said, making it safe and comfortable and a joy to be in, really is an enhancement of our mental health. And of course, gay men have good taste, so there's that too. <laughs> so, you know, when we make our home as single guys first, you know, when we have dates over, we're telling them who we are by, by what we create our our home space to be. Number two is managing finances. And I've written other articles about gay men and finances, such as Seven Ways to Take Care of Your Financial Self, which is available on GayTherapyLA.com. I think, unfortunately, certified financial planners in general, except for some, some very good gay ones, um, tend to focus on wealthier couples because, of course, two incomes are better than one, especially for them. But managing your finances as a single gay man is also especially important because you don't know how long you might be single. When you're single, all of the burdens of costs fall on you. There's no sharing the burden if you need a household repair or a household appliance, for example, or even a household service. 
and this makes the stakes higher with a stronger demand for more careful budgeting since you're relying only on yourself. So you might need to, to take care to cover yourself with short-term and long-term disability insurance if you can, for example. This is why two people can leave more cheaply being together rather than two people with the same incomes living apart or even with roommates because while a roommate might help you share the rent or the mortgage and utilities you don't have the building of a shared two-person family equity that partnered or certainly married gay men have. Balancing your short-term spending for quality of life with long-term savings in that taking care of you sense is very important. Books from financial gurus like Susie Orman, a lesbian by the way, and Jane Bryant Quinn have been enormously helpful to me. My parents were not the best at financial planning and teaching that. My grandparents were a little better. But even if you don't have uh, parents, could be mom, but it's oftentimes dad, um, because it's a very male gender role thing to do financial planning. But there's plenty of you know, financial experts like Susie Orman and Jane Bryant Quinn who are, are excellent experts. But if your family of origin didn't have a lot of financial literacy and skills, then you have to teach yourself. You have to take it upon yourself as an adult gay man to seek out what is financial literacy and financial skills to make the most of whatever income you have, especially if your income is lower. Financial planning is even more important. And then we have to make that translation to make financial planning that's so geared to married straight couples with families and children's college funds and that kind of thing, which can happen with gay men. But we have to make the translation to being single, and we also have to make the translation from straight to gay. And there's just certain things that require um, additional thought or consideration. But a lot of times, straight and gay singles have very similar financial planning needs. You know, even when I was really young, at 26, I started contributing to my corporate 401k at work, providing for myself for eventual retirement, um, and it would be another 11 years before I met my husband at 37. So we have to challenge this idea that long-term financial planning is only for couples or only for heterosexuals with children in the suburbs. And I think that's kind of a prevailing myth that single gay men, you know, a lot of single gay men that I've worked with as my clients don't really have some of the financial planning skills for the long term that I think they need. So my favorite resource for the young investor in particular is through Vanguard.com. They have a lot of different programs where, you know, the rule of thumb is you usually have to save up about $3,000. And that might be easy for some and it might be harder and take longer for others but that's about the amount that you really want to have to buy into something like um, a mutual fund but you can do that online with a link to your online banking with your checking your savings account through Vanguard there would be other brokerage houses but I find over many years I sound like a commercial for working for Vanguard with Vanguard.com is incredibly easy with their website and then you watch your investment savings grow over time so that you provide for yourself whether you have a partner or spouse or not. And if you have a 401k through your human resources department at work, that's really important to participate in because, you know, they can match your deposits anywhere from about 2 to even 6 or 10%. The average is about 3%, I think. Um, and that money really grows over time, and it's with pre-tax dollars in a paycheck, uh, you know, a payroll deposit with each pay period, and you kind of never miss it. So saving about 10 or 15 percent of your gross income, you know, every paycheck every year is really critical for long-term financial security. So number three is building a wardrobe. And when my friend R in San Diego suggested this, I was a bit surprised, but he's right. Um, men's magazines like GQ have occasionally written about the importance of a basic wardrobe of high quality staples of clothing that mix and match well and endure past transient changes in style. 
So knowing a set of good work and play shirts, pants, shoes, and accessories like belts and hats and jewelries and jewelry and watches can be a sound investment that serves you well over time. And it's just like your home decor, your own personal wardrobe is an outward expression of who you are, such as how gender conforming or not you are, what colors or fabrics express your personality, and what personal style you exude, from the artistic to the conservative to the edgy to the theatrical, etc. I mean, personally, I love age-inappropriate clothing that challenges stereotypes, and I like tight-fitting clothes that motivate me even more in the gym. And today, more than ever, people in general, and gay men in particular, have more latitude on what is accepted attire, and even if it's not accepted by the general society, screw it, wear it anyway. If you do end up meeting a partner, what you're wearing will already tell him a little bit about yourself even before you even speak. Like I met my husband at a dance club when I was wearing leather jeans that laced up the sides, and later when I went home with him, which is another whole story, the hash marks from the leather laces on these tight pants were still visible on my bare legs, which was both amusing and kind of a harbinger of things to come in the next 18 years, with us kind of dabbling in the leather community. <laughs> so it was all in the stars. It was like the pilot episode of a sitcom or something. So number four is grocery shopping. When you're single and buying food and cooking for one, it can be a challenge. I generally used to cook for two or more and have the same dish for a couple of dinners or maybe some uh, leftover l for lunches. And if you don't know how to cook as a single gay man, at least a little bit, I really think you need to learn. You need to really invest the time in that because it will pay off over and over and over again for many years to come. This will not only save you money, but you also can control the quality of the nutrition you get, such as controlling the amount of sodium, carbs, fat, etc. that you're consuming. Being able to cook at least some is also a selling point for you and a couple. You know, as they say, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> so on a single income, using various discount strategies like coupons and those store card clubs, that all becomes more important, you know, so that you have more money to tip the go-go boys at the bars. And knowing which ingredients are good values is also important. And this goes way beyond things like, you know, rice and ramen. Good shopping skills are good life skills for both single and partnered life. Number five is your relationship to your family of origin. Now, as gay men, we have both our family of origin and our family of choice. Relationships with our families of origin can vary from being very close to being very distant if we've been ostracized by anti-gay parents or others. One mistake I see in single gay ma male clients um, is that they can be so comfortable with their family of origin, especially in Latino cultures, but others as well, that the time and focus spent on parents or even siblings can eclipse time making yourself available and putting yourself out there to other single gay men who could become eventual partners. And this is a life management or time management skill of your leisure time outside work. If you like seeing your family in your free time, if they live locally especially, that's great, but you have to balance that with spending some free time in locations or activities that might offer the opportunity for what I call peer socialization. Guys can't date you if they don't know you exist, you know, out in the world. And this is assuming that meeting potential dates is important to you. We certainly have to challenge this notion that a gay man or anyone is not complete without a partner or spouse. Straight women get this message all the time, like all the Disney princess movies, Betty Friedan said a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And that's kind of a heterosexual feminist statement, but we could also kind of adapt that and say we are not necessarily incomplete just because we're not partnered, even though being partnered or married certainly conveys a certain social privilege. But I think we have to challenge that notion of partnered privilege as the only legitimate way to live. Being single indefinitely, or even forever, is not a second-rate way of life, 
And yet I find myself challenging clients on this often who feel that they failed at life because they are or choose to be single. Some very successful at life gay men live very robustly through a combination of family of origin and family of choice interaction while remaining single in the long term. Number six is gift giving to friends and family. My friend R also brought this up and I think it's important. When you're single, you might buy gifts for holidays, anniversaries, weddings and the holiday season, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever, for individual family members only to receive joint or group gifts in return. You give your brother, his wife, and their two kids individual birthday and holiday gifts throughout the year, but you get one gift from all of them back. If you're single, young, and on a limited budget, this can be a hardship on your post-college entry-level salary budget. You might have to negotiate how your family of origin handles this to recognize the obvious imbalance. Same thing with friends. You might be very close to friends, but you might not be able to extend to attend um, expensive group birthday dinners where everyone splits the bill equally no matter who ordered what. I sometimes teach assertive communication skills to clients on how to stick to their gifts budget without overextending themselves. Find alternative ways to celebrate family or friend events because as a single gay man it just might not be feasible to meet all the gift giving obligations in the course of the year unless your income can really provide for that. Number seven is entertaining at home. Just like your home decor, it's important to try to find ways that make living alone or with roommates not so isolated. Even if you can't afford a large space to live in, as many urban young single gay men cannot, you might be able to have a few friends over at a time to watch something on TV or to play games in a game night. In this way, not only do you offer your unique personality as a resource for your friends or even dates, but you also offer your home. They get to see more of the real you in your native habitat, <laughs> so to speak. This helps support the mutual, rewarding, interpersonal relationships that we all need and that gay men tend to thrive on in our families of choice. If you can't afford professionally catered or professionally bartended parties, Think of low-cost snacks or for a TV or, or game night from the big warehouse stores, Costco or Sam's Club or whatever these are. Um, you know, or even suggest some fabulously themed fun potluck as an event. And then just invite as many people as your particular space can accommodate at one time. Maybe you break it up into different circles that you know. Number eight is planning and budget travel. So when I was much younger and single, traveling alone or with friends became an art form. I made relatively little at that time, but I still had a young man's wanderlust and a thirst for adventure to see and do things in the world. I just had a lot of that, you know, 20 something, 30 something energy, you know, that made me want to get out and see the world, which is a very young person's trait, male or female, uh, gay or straight. And just like with financial planning, like I was talking about earlier, try to, to design your career and your budget with at least some recreational travel in mind, including at times traveling alone, which can feel very adventuresome. You can even have a separate travel budget savings account at your bank or at an investment firm like Vanguard, as I was saying, and make regular online contributions toward it which is easy to do with online banking and online account transfers. Like maybe you do 3% of your weekly take-home pay and that funds one or two vacations in the year or weekend trips away. Number nine is dating. There are dozens of books for single gay men about dating. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the titles now. Neil Kaminsky, K-A-M-I-N-S-K-Y. Um, I forget the title of that, but Neil Kaminsky has a couple of books. The books by Joe Court about dating, K-O-R-T, um, are very good. There's lots of them. And I've written articles about uh, gay men's dating. If you look on GayTherapyLA.com, The Six Lights Theory... 
uh, just search that in the little search box on the blog tab. The Six Light Theory of Dating is something I really stand by that keeps playing out over and over again with different clients I work with. And as a single gay man, I think you have to allot the free time that you have outside of work, like the slices of a pie. How much do you allocate for seeing your family of origin? How much for seeing peer friends? How much for activities for self-care that you do for yourself, like the gym or yoga or running, expressing yourself artistically, like something that you make with your hands, having just your chill time, playing video games, and then how much to getting your sexual needs met through hooking up or after a date where you have dinner or see a movie or a concert or a play or you go on a hike or you visit a museum. If you want your, a partner and you find yourself not dating, get busy. That's all there is to it. You know, master the art of the online profile or engage in in-person activities where gay men congregate, perhaps in bars or clubs. Of course, we have to do that after this whole COVID-19 thing. That might look very different in 2020 and maybe beyond. You have to make a study of good dating skills, you know, such as talking, expressing yourself, putting words onto feelings, as well as listening, which is really key. You know, active listening and reflecting what your date is saying to you. And being your authentic self, not somebody else, while at the same time being courteous enough to be you, but it's you at your best. Because, you know, all those endearing flaws that you have will inevitably become obvious just over time with this person. There's plenty of time to show your downside after you've seen plenty of your upside. Number 10 is friendships. We don't want pure platonic friendships to be the chronic consolation prize for not having a partner. Many gay men, in, including me at the time, might have had unconscious reasons for not wanting to partner, such as fear of a loss of our own autonomy, or not wanting to repeat our parents' dysfunctional relationship that we witnessed growing up. We might have core schema, as therapists say, beliefs about ourselves that we're somehow unworthy of love or having nothing to offer a partner, so we spare others by keeping ourselves chronically single. We might even hang out with straight guys or straight women or lesbians to avoid any possibility the platonic gay male friend could lead to more. We might avoid dating because we have unresolved trauma related to past sexual abuse or sexual assault experiences, and we keep ourselves safe by staying single for good. Therapy can help you uncover any kind of unconscious resistance like that and help you to make your choices more aware and conscious, deliberate and authentic to what you really want. Friendships, though, can be a form of romance in itself, such as the bromance. You know, it's not a domestic or sexual necessarily, but it's a form of love that we all need, including after we meet a partner or spouse. We still might have friends that we love apart from our primary relationship. The legendary couples therapist whom I love, Esther Perel, P-E-R-E-L, she's Belgian with a beautiful French accent, uh, search that on YouTube and you'll find all kinds of good videos of her. You know, she speaks of how we all put too much pressure on one partner or a spouse to be our everything in one person. Confidant, playmate, roommate, sexual partner, colleague, sounding board, sparring partner, and we live twice as long as other historical periods. And this can be too much to expect of one person. Friendships are at least in part a component of a comprehensive quality of life that lives apart from our primary r romantic relationship status. Much of my work with gay men surrounds how to cultivate, maintain, and certainly troubleshoot relationships, even those that are strictly platonic. You know, difficulties between friends, those are still relationships that require, as I say about romantic relationships, commitment, communication, and compromise. Urban centers that often offer tolerance or even celebration of diversity in LGBT life can also be crowded, busy, expensive places to live where it's difficult to make friends even, you know, like when it takes over an hour to get where they are to socialize or where the local culture, like Los Angeles, 
is pretty cliquish and very difficult to penetrate established circles of guarded, competitive, or even elitist friends who are wary of accepting new members. So making friends is a skill and kind of an art form of putting yourself out there and coping with your own social anxiety. I work with guys on that a lot about social anxiety that is really the fear of negative evaluation by others. And we kind of have to just get past that and say, you know what, um, those guys have to take it or leave it. That's who you're, you're not going to change who you are. Number 11 is sex. When you don't have a regular live-in partner who offers sex at the ready in all times, although this is largely a myth, actually, getting your natural sexual needs met is an art form. Hooking up in ways that don't compromise your physical health, emotional health, or even physical and emotional safety can be challenging. Our apps and website, websites lifestyle is at best problematic and at worst demoralizing. Lots of guys complain about the limitations of Grindr and Scruff and Hornet and you know all of these apps because they're a product of modern technology and they're a reflection of our kind of hookup society but they're kind of imperfect. People and human relationships are much more complex even than the advanced technology that makes the online apps possible. You know, these are wonders of smartphones and programming and, you know, decades of technology that really kind of originated with the space program. Putting a man on the moon in the 60s helps us to have a smartphone in our pocket today. But be that as it may, you know, the apps are not foolproof. You know, but we wouldn't have gone through the difficulty of coming out and challenging the dominant, default, heterosexist paradigm that we are pressured to conform to since birth if we didn't honor what Mother Nature gives us as our natural desire and our primal need for sexual gratifications in the ways that work for us and our particular arousal makeup. And as a trained sex therapist, also, I, I work with these ideas all the time, helping gay male clients bridge the gap between the kind of sexual life that they have and the kind of sexual life they really want, whether it's frequency or type or duration or function or location or type of partner they want it with. Getting your sexual needs met is a combination of profoundly knowing and accepting yourself and asserting that to partners who are buying what you're selling in a sexual relationship, whether that's for 20 minutes or for a lifetime. Troubleshooting emotional, physical, or social hang-ups about sexual encounters and functioning is a large percentage of what I do in therapy or coaching for gay men across the world because sexuality is one of the greatest human common denominators for all of us, but so are the related sexual anxieties. It's important to ask yourself what kind of role do you want for your sexuality and its expression as a single gay man according to your desires, your values, your culture, your opportunities, and your resources of when and where and with whom your sex will be. Number 12, existential meaning. Will I always be single? When I work with single gay men, they almost always want to discuss the existential state of being single, especially if they are single, but they want to be partnered or married. They might even want to be gay dads. They want a certain ideal of companionship, sexuality, work, play, and even a combination of domestic familiarity and comfort, along with spontaneity and variety that lasts a lifetime. It's a big item on the wish list for Santa Claus to bring you. And sometimes, even often, it works out. I work with gay male couples all the time who have found each other, and except for maybe some things they want to work on in couples therapy or, or online relationship coaching, they're having a good time of it. They're meant for each other, and they're going to be together for a long time. They just want some help with a problem here or there. But it's a combination of your efforts, right now and then sustained in the future, plus the efforts of others, in reasonably equal measures. That's what makes a relationship domestically, is your efforts plus theirs, and you kind of meet in the middle. And while we can certainly identify the thoughts and feelings, and especially behaviors, that create an environment where long-lasting, loving, domestic 
relationships can happen, we still rely, unfortunately, on a certain amount of serendipity, luck, or even fate of whether or not that happens for us at all or when. It's the old Supreme song. You can't hurry love. No, you just have to wait. You just give it time. It's a game of give and take. And that, unfortunately, is one of the hardest things that I work with guys on is this idea of wanting the magic of love and connection to happen, being struck by Cupid's arrow. And you can't really rush that. And it takes an enormous amount of patience. And yet, what a waste of precious life minutes or hours or years if we only declare that we can be happy if we are not single and not who we are in this moment or this month. That's kind of kicking the can of happiness down the road or always having happiness around the next corner. And that's a tragic squandering of time and life that many people who were terminally ill would have loved to have had. We have to make existential meaning of our lives and quality of life regardless of whether we are single or not and whether we like it or not. Ironically, learning to live our best life single will paradoxically make us vibrant, happy, involved, active, attractive people that other people want to partner with. And whether we meet someone today, tomorrow, next week, or never, we remember that life itself is a gift. And what we do with it is our gift back to life. So, if you would like more information about the therapy or coaching that I do for gay male individuals or couples, please feel free to reach out. In these days of the COVID era, era lockdown, I'm doing uh, sessions through phone or through some kind of a webcam platform. I use several. Um, I usually see clients in my office and online. Lately, it's been you know all online. Uh, there can be some exceptions in, in limited circumstances, but it takes a lot of work to kind of maintain social distancing and stuff, so online is better. But if you're interested in doing that, please feel free, call or text my cell, that is in the United States, area code 310-339-5778. So 310-339-5778. Or email me, ken at gaytherapyla.com. And we have myself and then several clinicians who are available at different fee levels and are available on different schedules. And we all offer online services to anywhere in the world and we would be happy to help. So your comments and questions and all that are welcome also if you want to email or text those. Even suggestions for future episodes, although my friend R in San Diego has given me a bunch, there's going to be more from R, and we're very grateful to him for uh, giving me those ideas, but other people can do that too. Maybe we'll have a contest or something. Anyway, take good care, and I'll see you next time.